Merci, Bernadette. Thank you very much, Bernadette. I really am delighted to be here. Thank you to Autism Europe as well. It's now 10 minutes to 11. And I was told that I could speak for 40 minutes. That has been changed into 30 minutes. So this is going to be a very quick one. I hope you're in good shape. Uh, it's a bit dark, but are there any Japanese people in the audience? Any Japanese people? Raise your hand if you're Japan. No? Okay, no Japanese people? Because there will be a lot of talking about you in my presentation. Um, and you will find out why. Okay. Um, in 2015, the United Nations said, leave no one behind. And they set as one of the 30 um, goals for 2030, sustainable development goals, inclusive education. And this was confirmed by Europe because the European Agency for Special Needs and Inclusive Education wrote a report based on more than 200 studies saying that inclusive education is not just for the purpose of including children at school, but it has benefits on the long term. It creates uh, opportunities to get connected to your peers. It results in better social and academic outcomes for students with disabilities. And most of all, those students who have been included successfully, um, later on in life, they are more independent and they uh, are also becoming financially in the more independent, which is, of course, also a good thing for society in general. So I think nobody uh, discusses the value of inclusion as a most valuable goal in education. However, there is a gap between our intention and how we succeed. Because this is often what happens. We have it as a goal, but in reality, we see the opposite quite often. Um, around 4% of all students um, are being excluded temporarily or sometimes finally from school. If we look at the numbers of autistic students who are being excluded, that's around 30%, which is a lot. Some of them temporarily, some of them for uh, special activities at school. So we dream of inclusion, but actually we see a lot of exclusion. And even those kids who are included in school, often there's a huge difference between the theory and the intention. We have the ambition, we have the good intentions, but if we look at what really happens, even for those autistic students who are formally included in school, we often see that they are being sent home because their assistant is unavailable or sick. They particip participate in the normal program, but they're often excluded from school trips. They spend quite some time in timeout rooms, and some of these autistic children, they are physically present in the classroom, but they are not actively engaged in what's happening in the classroom. And there's more proof. Um, studies have now shown that a lot of autistic students, they are actually not excluded, but they are kind of isolated uh, or on the periphery of social relationships within the school. And this is not only true for the relationship with their peer students, but it seems also that the quality of the relationship that students, autistic students have with their teachers is poorer than for students with other special needs or for typically developing students. And um, if that was not enough, there's also a number of studies that point into the direction of autistic students being more prone to bullying and more vulnerable here. And if that is still not worse enough, there's also the other challenges. It's not just the social challenges in the school. There's also the physical challenges of often a sensory unfriendly environment. There's also the challenges of communication. Teachers using very confusing instructions such as we're going to do that later for autistic students with their context blindness. It's quite difficult to find out what later concretely means when a teacher says that, which leads to a lot of misunderstandings of tasks they get um, and although it seems like funny to see these things, uh, it often leads in reality to a negative feedback because it seems that they made a lot of mistakes and that they do not master um, the part of the curriculum, curriculum while they are actually in an autistic way misunderstanding the instruction. So to summarize this, I think 
if you're autistic, going to school is like going to two schools simultaneously, which means the one school with the learning curriculum that all the students have, but on the other hand, you, if you have autism, you have all these extra challenges, sensory challenges, social challenges, communication challenges, so there's also the school of, that you need to survive. Now, to, to show it, let's say this is the curriculum for a student without autism, hmm? math and then English, and then there's a break which is relaxing, then history and so on. The same student in the same school but who has autism, probably the curriculum looks like this. Math requires a lot of executive functions. English is all about communication. A break is often a lot of demands. In philosophy, maybe you have to think about things that are very abstract, which requires imagination, which is not so easy for autistic students, and so on. So, have you any idea what it means going to two schools simultaneously? Have you any idea how it feels getting a double program? Well, let's, let's try it out. I will give you a double program now, which means I'm going to ask you, with your neighbor, to do some social skills training while I continue with my very short presentation. Okay, so talk to your neighbor and you speak your own language. You speak your own language, talk to your own neighbor, and I want you to find out during my presentation with your neighbor how you should bow when you greet a Japanese person. Also talk about when you take a Japanese person to a restaurant, what is absolutely not done. Okay, you can start now working on your social skills together with your neighbor. Please start. Okay, I'll continue uh, now. Um, and I'll add some communication challenges here. So um, I'll continue with my lecture, but from now on, my PowerPoint will be in this language. Okay, there are people who can read my slides. Raise your hands, yeah. That means there's a lot of people from the Netherlands and Belgium. I'm very happy to see you, by the way. For the rest, no problem. Ask them what it means. <laughs> okay. So this is the double curriculum. Okay. Now, many think, you know what? If, if we have these challenges, let's teach these children social skills, communication skills. That will help them to be successful at school and more included. I doubt that. Because if you already have a double program, it means you will have a lot of stress. And not only autistic people, but nobody learns when they have too much stress. Remember your first school day, all the uncertainties, all the doubts you had, the new things that you did not know, will mama pick me up again at the evening? Now, all those uncertainties, remember that every school day is like that. Then you get probably a little bit of an impression what it means to have autism. So autism intensifies the daily stressors and the daily concerns. Let me just give an example of that. Look, on the left you see the bucket, the stress bucket of a student without autism. He has to work at school, so that means bucket is being filled. Imagine that the student with autism has the same bucket and it fills equally fast, which is often not yet the case, but okay. But then there's a break. And what happens with our stress bucket when we have a break? Well, we can throw away a little bit of the stress and relax. And then we get back to work, which means we fill it up again. Any idea what school breaks means for autistic students? Yeah. It often means more stress because it's unstructured, it's social, it's difficult. So when they get back to work, this happens. So there's a meltdown at that moment. So there's this pileup of stress. And you know what? We should find the balance and, and lower down the stress in order to teach them the skills they need to survive at school. We can make another mistake as well and make it too easy. So this is a challenge of finding what uh, Mikhail, Mikali and then his family name has called the flow. Hmm? So many think it works like this, but I think it works like this. Feel good and then you will be able to learn the social skills you need to get included. And there's a lot of research in happiness that has shown this. There's a, a, a link between negative feelings and rigidity in thinking, focusing too much on details. I put it into green because you all know that these are characteristics of the autistic brain. So if we can change it into an upwards positive spiral and give autistic students' positive feelings, it will increase their flexibility, their cognitive functioning, and their adaptability. 
And based on a lot of research on happiness, we know that people who are the most happy people in the world are the most successful ones, and not the other way around. It's not the most successful ones that are the most happy ones. So the primary focus should not be on changing autistic students to fit in, but on making them feel good. And we don't do that. This is an overview of all evidence-based practices for children and youth with autism. Uh, 456 studies were being reviewed here. And you see the majority of the studies aimed at improving the communication skills of students with autism, their social skills, managing challenging behaviors. And it's appalling, I think, that only one study or 0.2% focused on the well-being of children with autism. And when we do focus on well-being, we do it from a negative point of view. So we, we uh, research the stress and the anxiety levels, um, which to me is not okay. Well, at least you pay attention to the difficulties, but it's a kind of negative approach. And what I often see is that autistic students in school, as long as there is no aggression or depression, everybody thinks that the student is fine. No. A more positive approach is not saying we only get into action when there are behavioral or mental health issues. We should make sure that well-being and good feeling is more than the absence of mental health issues. And there's proof again. The study that I showed about exclusion looked also into the factors that helped children, autistic children, reintegrate. And one of the, the key factors for successful reintegration of students who were excluded was efforts towards improving their well-being. So happiness should be number one on the EIP of autistic students. Actually, it should be number one for every student. Hmm? By the way, how far are you with your social skills training? I noticed that a lot of people stopped. Please continue talking to your neighbor about how to bow, bow to a Japanese person. How often do you see these in a diagnostic report. You know, when, when we talk about autistic students, we often focus mainly on the deficits, the difficulties. And that's not a good starting point if you want to work on good feeling. I have a very good friend, uh, Paula Klutz. She's a, a, a teacher consultant in the United States. And she has developed this very famous test. It's called the birthday present test. And what is the birthday present test? She says, when I come into a classroom, for an autistic student and they give me the diagnostic report, I look into the report if I can find something to buy this boy or girl a gift for his or her birthday. And if I don't find anything in the diagnostic report that gives me ideas to give a present to the child, then I throw it away. It's a very easy test and it's a very powerful one. So try to find out what makes them feel good. And there's two mistakes we can make. One is to force autistic students into so-called neurotypical aspects of um, well-being. For instance, a boy who had always stood at the corner of the playground and everybody said, oh, poor little boy, let's give him a social story so he can get involved with the other children. And he looked at it and he said, very nice, but I don't want to do this. Well, aren't you lonely there? standing in the corner, he said, no, I feel perfectly fine here. I like to watch other kids. I don't necessarily have to be involved actively. And by the way, I feel more safe here because when I'm standing in the corner, nobody can just suddenly pop up behind my back and touch me. So what's wrong with that? Do children necessarily have to play together to be happy? Now, another thing mistake we can make, and I see this happening a lot these days, is to force autistic people in stereotyped ideas about autism. Hmm? Um, here's an example of a girl who said that she got a separate room to do her test at high school, but she said, I didn't need that. What I needed instead was a clear visual overview of where and when I got lessons because that changed all the time. So it's so sad that people have a whole set of autism-friendly adaptations, but not the ones you actually need. And this is happening more and more, that we force autistic people into stereotyped one-liners about autism. So try to find out, and there's many ways to do that. There's no time, but I described some strategies in good autism practice. Um, and try to find 
a positive approach here because there are no a lot of checklists for sensory issues, for instance, but what about finding out the sensory preferences? Do not only focus into the sensory difficulties, try to find out what gives autistic students a good sensory experience. And there's now things that are available to do that. You know, I made the mistake myself. I, many years ago, I developed an autism stress questionnaire, and the only result was that parents and professionals who filled in the questionnaire, which is 10 pages long, all were more or less suicidal at the end of filling in the questionnaire. Hmm? Because it's so, you know, it gives you such a negative feeling. So I think, and this is one that has been translated now in many languages, and it's available through my website, we should find out what autistic, uh, make autistic people feel good. And make it concrete. Asking a student at the end of the day, tell me how was your day is not very autism friendly. So this is what we did with the student. After every lesson, he, he color coded how well he felt. And green mean I felt well, yellow well, not so well but not bad orange was i was a little bit stressed red was wow i really felt bad during this and in that way this is doing a more concrete analysis together with the students okay and then how can we increase the well-being many people when you ask how can you increase somebody's well-being they think about relaxation cognitive behavioral therapy mindfulness which is a very good idea but too often we wait until somebody is stressed before we start doing the strategies. I think if you do it, and this is a very good example of the National Autistic Society in the UK, uh, allocate the time in their day schedule. Don't put only tasks there that are school tasks. Put relaxation or, or trying to distract yourself, emptying your stress bucket, put it in there as an explicit activity. Because autistic people, given their difficulties with interoception, often will have difficulties feeling when their bucket is full. So just plan it. Hmm? And then there's autism friendliness. Okay. Now, um, I will give you some tips, but first, remember what is absolutely not done when you take a Japanese person to a restaurant. Start discussing about that now with your neighbor in your own language. Come on, work a little bit harder. Hmm? Okay, what is an autism-friendly school? It's sensory-friendly, it's um, socially safe, it's strengths-focused. But the solid foundation is predictability and clarity. That's actually number one. So if you want to make autistic students feel good, make sure you give clarity and predictability, and the rest comes later. Remember again the example of the girl who said, I didn't need a separate room, I needed an overview of where and when, that's predictability. And, and the reason is that because of their complex blind brain, autistic people find it very hard to understand how a school works and when will happen, uh, what and how long it will take. And that's the biggest source of distress in autism, it's the uncertainty. So therefore we need to clarify the world for them. And, and it's something that you can all do. Actually, this should be part of universal design. You know, it's little things like rules for the playgrounds, rules for outside, or on the right you see an example from a, a Flemish school, just a photograph on the desk that shows you how to clean up your desk. This very concrete information helps to clarify the unwritten rules, clarify the turn-taking by using a microphone so that every child can see the one who has the microphone is the one who's allowed now to talk. This is making things very concrete. So clarify times, places and tasks, and many of you already do that, I know that. So that means, yeah, you're doing a good job if you use these visuals. Hmm? So use concrete communication, that's the biggest thing. Hmm? Um, and concrete communication clarifies the context that autistic students cannot imagine or see spontaneously. It's answering all these questions that the other students can get answered uh, intuitively. This is clearly an example of no concrete communication. Child is raising his hand because he gets stuck in a task. Teacher says, just continue with what you're doing. I'll be right with you. What do you think he did? Yeah, he remained sitting like that. <laughs> And what is, I'll be right with you, is that within half an hour or within 10 seconds? This is no concrete communication. Yeah, but our instructions are clear, aren't they? No, they aren't. This is in alphabetical order. 
That's not what the teacher meant. Hmm? Then sensory friendly, and here I won't go into details, there's not enough time, but please don't think that sensory friendly only means eliminating or reducing stimuli. Hmm? We sometimes, it is, there's no research that shows that sometimes we even have to amplify stimuli to make autistic students more involved. The, the biggest thing is give control over the sensory environment. Socially safe, what does that mean? Okay, that means, first of all, that teachers should be more knowledgeable about autism. Because in Flanders we have a saying, unknown is unloved. Which means if you don't know and understand something, you probably will not display a positive attitude. So we need to train teachers. They don't have to become autism experts, but they should have basic knowledge about what autism is and how to relate to an autistic student in the classroom. And the same is true for the peers. We should uh, do this well thought of disclosure, and that, mm, that isn't the same as, look, here's Peter, he's autistic, you all know now, okay. No, uh, it's all about the process um, where we teach not only the other kids a little bit about autism, but also translate it into concrete actions. What can you do to support your autistic peer? Mm? There are programs for that. There's some hidden advertising on this slide as well. Some of you will notice it. <laughs> okay, and then getting an, on workspace, smaller groups, working apart together. Very autism friendly. What is working apart together? Well, you know, everything is in group, but working in group does not mean that you have to physically be in that group all the time. You get your instructions in group, and then everybody does their own part of the group work at their own desk, and then they come back to share it. This is working apart together, which is very helpful for a lot of autistic students. It in decreases the stress of having to be present, physically present in the group work all the time. By the way, talking about group work, how far are you with your social skills training? Made any progress? Okay, and then the last thing is, and I'm almost finished here, strengths focused. You know, um, we have done experiments both in Netherlands and Flanders, and what we saw is that buddy systems work very well. But too often, when we think about installing buddy systems, we only think about non-autistic students supporting autistic students. I would love to see autistic students being buddies of non-autistic students, because autistic students often have something to offer. Hmm? For instance, autistic students often excel in, in things like math or science, and some other kids well, they have difficulties with math and science. Let the autistic student support the non-autistic student. That's better for self-esteem, but that is better for inclusion as well, because we are more eager to include someone in a group if we see the benefit of that person, if we, that person has something to offer that we like. And the, so that means autism-friendly environment is not the same as overprotecting students with autism. It's helping them also to face the challenges of school. Because, and some of you know this slide, this is my favorite slide, the puppy slide it is called. Happiness is not the absence of problems, it's the ability to deal with them. Therefore, believe in the strengths of autistic students. Yes, they have a difficult time, but don't underestimate their strength. But teach them to cope with a full bucket, bucket of stress. Teach them about stress. Because the worst thing we can do is to take over. And to protect autistic students, say, it's too hard for you, I'll take over, you can have an exception, you don't have to be on the playground because that's sensory unfriendly. On the long term, you create something that psychologists have known for many decades as learned helplessness. So don't avoid the challenges for the autistic students, but give them control. Hmm? Teach them how to control, and one way to give them control is something that we use in Belgium a lot in our classrooms and also in our groups for adults. It's an escape scenario, a script that clarifies to a student what he or she can do when it becomes too much. Be careful not to make the mistake that we made in Belgium. In the beginning, the escape scenario only told them that they could escape. We forgot to mention that they also can come back. Hmm? So an escape scenario should also include that one. Okay, so I'm at the end here. What are the keys for successful inclusion of autistic students? Please do know that students that feel good perform better. So don't try to change their skill levels first, try to increase their well-being first. And clarity and predictability are number one in giving students with autism 
a good feeling. However, an autism-friendly environment is not the same as avoiding obstacles. And then the last thing is a solution-focused and strengths-based approach is necessary. I think Rebecca will talk about that later on. And don't forget, autistic students have something to offer as well. Okay. You finished with your social skills training. Here is what you should have found out. Straight back, hands at the sides, eyes down, and the depth of the bow depends on the status. You see it explained on the right. And when you take a Japanese person to a restaurant, what is absolutely not done, well, it's taking them to a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> Domo arigato.